Welcome, welcome everyone. Um, uh, my name is Shonika Rishidas. I'm director of the Center for Hindu Studies. Um, uh, many of you may have had something uh, to do with the, the center in some form of education. And uh, I presume that's why you're here. And I even see some staff members here. And that's, that's worrying or enthusing. I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, but anyway, so what we're talking about is, is the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies, why it's important or why it isn't important. Um, uh, and I'm going to talk about why it's important. And you can respond back as to why it isn't important, maybe. Um, the center itself is next year going to be 25 years old. So it's a it's a good time to start talking about this um, because that's quarter of a century. And I suppose at this stage, we can begin to see if it has had any impact. Um, and I, that's, I suppose, how we assess things. Um, to have a center for Hindu studies, you may think, is obvious. But it wasn't obvious when we started it. In fact, we were the first academic center for Hindu studies uh, in the world. Uh, no one had thought of developing a center for Hindu studies. Um, and that's, that's not because anyone had anything against Hinduism or Hindu culture or Hindu aesthetics or art or literature or theology or philosophy or, or anything like that. Um, it's just that uh, in India, no one studied this academically or in the education system, the government education system, or even in private institutions. Um, this wasn't studied. Um, that was because of a kind of an accident of fate. Uh, Nehru decided, um, and other people counseled otherwise, but he, he was quite adamant that there should be no religious education in the Indian education system. Now, unfortunately, to say that Hindu culture is purely religious, I, I think that was the first misunderstanding. Um, uh, but anyway, that, consequently, you can study Christianity and Buddhism and Jainism and Islam, but you can't study Hinduism. So it's, it's just a strange uh, circumstance developed. Um, and we can look into the politics and, and that, and that's interesting in and of itself. But that's the reason why uh, these studies never took place in India uh, academically. So there, there hasn't been since independence um, an intellectual vocabulary to discuss issues of Hindu cultures and traditions, uh, to discuss um, Hindu philosophies and Hindu theologies and Hindu aesthetics. And that's left uh, the culture at, uh, to a great disadvantage and also liable to be hijacked by anyone who wanted to define it and interpret it. Uh, and they would interpret it. And of course, there's no one there really to argue intellectually from a base of knowledge to say, well, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? Because no one has that knowledge base. So that's that's very sad and very poor, uh, we could say. So consequently, the in the academy, the only places where you found Hindu studies done at a high degree were, were in um, academies in other countries. And these were just individuals who took on the studies because of personal interest. And um, in there weren't any chairs of Hindu studies or lectureships in Hindu studies. As I say, it was just individuals in various departments. This was just their interest. And when they retired from their position, their replacement didn't necessarily do Hindu studies. So it was just up and down in different universities and different subject areas. You'd find these wonderful people who did excellent research uh, and published wonderful books about Hinduism. Um, and now you have a situation where um, some Hindus are saying, well, why are you non-Indians telling us about our culture? And uh, and it's very difficult to answer that question, <laughs> because, partly because you didn't take it seriously academically, and you, you made a decision about it, and what, what can we do? So anyway, that's the thinking behind it. 
And this this kind of um, it's something that dawned on us when the center manifest when it began to develop. It developed in Christ Church College in Oxford in the the um, rooms of the Regis Professor of Divinity, who had invited me around for a cup of tea. And over that cup of tea, he talked about he wanted to, um, as he said, bring the wind, the winds of Hindu thought into the stuffy corridors of the theology faculty of Oxford. Um, he, he wanted really to open up the teaching of world religions because Oxford was famed and brilliant at teaching Hindu, uh, sorry, Christian theology in the theology faculty, but nothing else. So he wanted to open that up. And he did it effectively to the extent that the theology became renamed the Faculty of Theology and Religion. Um, but that that's what started over a cup of tea. And he asked if this would be something that we might be able to do. And we started to do it, as I say, only to realize that we were the only people doing it. So we began to realize that there was... Um, we had a responsibility to strategically and systematically develop the subject so that it could become a subject of merit in the academy and also to create um, uh, a benchmark. Uh, there are certain expectations in the, in the academy of excellence, uh, certainly in Oxford there is, uh, of excellence, of dispassionate research, of critical, the critical analytical uh, empiric academic process um, and to create a benchmark for Hindu studies in that space that this is this is what it looks like in the intellectual space so that it could be um, transported to other centers so it's not just the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies let there be many centers for Hindu studies particularly in India of course that let it uh, begin to flourish in India but that there is a benchmark of very high quality that people need to respond to so that we can ensure that this is uh, worth worthwhile. So there, there were some realizations we had at the very beginning that this is a, a real responsibility we have. And if we get it right, um, it means that we can, it's not simply an academic project, but it's a project that is going to benefit people at many different levels uh, in, in society, in many different cultures, in many different religions. Um, etc. So that brings us to my next point about broadening the discussion is one of our became one of our aims. By by doing this kind of study, you're broadening the discussion in the academy because you're opening up a whole new field of study. We did have some pushback by people who just clearly said that Hinduism isn't a subject. That was one response from eminent scholars. Um, you can't do Indian philosophy because they don't have one. Uh, that was from a philosophy professor of merit. Um, so, so there was there was pushback, but it it wasn't. It was only from, as they would say in American Western films, ornery critters. It was only from people who were just got out of the wrong side of the bed that morning, or stayed out of the wrong side of the bed all their life, maybe. Um, and they just had an unfortunate attitude towards the world. Um, but for most people, they they did see the value of it, and we we did have a lot of support. But in the academy itself, so you, you're developing a whole new field of study. This isn't Indological studies. This isn't Sanskritic studies. This isn't um, Indian studies, shall we say, in inverted commas. This is very specifically Hindu studies. And... Uh, the wonderful thing about it maybe is that no one has ever successfully defined the word Hindu. So we can kind of do what we like a little bit. <laughs> uh, the, the world's our oyster when it comes to this uh, area. Also, we're broadening discussion in schools because um, over the last 25 years, graduates of the center have written books for schools uh, or works that they have done have been used to write books for schools. So this is, it's trickling down from the, the high academy, the ivory towers of Oxford. And I, I'm sure you've all heard about the scholars and their ivory towers. Those 
physical ivory towers are actually in Oxford. They're in All Souls College. So, so literally, it's trickling down from the ivory towers, and it is going into um, school books in different countries and in different cultures. So it is uh, helping, again, broaden the discussion. That was a feedback that we had from a lot of Indian people here in, in the UK who um, elected to do uh, religion uh, in, in high school. And there's two opportunities to do um, religion in high school. A lot of them took the first, and very few took the second. And so we asked them, and, and um, the feedback was they didn't recognize themselves when the teacher taught about Hinduism. They didn't know what they were talking about. And they would, there were certain kind of tropes that, that teachers would always come across. They talk about sati, the widow burning, which is kind of ancient history. They would talk about casteism and various things. And interestingly, in these communities in Leicester and in Bolton and in Scotland and in London, casteism isn't their issue. Um, of a group of 27 Oxford students that I, just, that I asked the question of, you know, what, what's your caste? Three of them knew. The rest of them actually didn't know. It was just was a non-issue for them. So, so for these people living in the diaspora, and there are, I think, 30 million Hindus in diaspora, um, this, this was an irrelevant way of teaching the subject uh, and quite uninformed as well. So that, that's broadened the discussion there. And also broadening the discussion in public debate. So um, we hear an awful lot about the environment and what, what are Hindu responses to environmental change, um, you could say. So where is where uh, is Hinduism represented on Newsnight or 60 Minutes in America or any of these, or 60, or 60 Minutes is Australia. There must be an American equivalent. <laughs> uh, but, it, you know, in some talk show host thing in America, whatever goes on, um, where is the, where are the Hindu representatives, the kind of people that you go to because they're interesting? It's not simply because they're Hindu, that's not the issue, but they're interesting. So where is where are these public intellectuals? Um, and it's it's beginning to develop that kind of uh, discourse. And just an example of of what the contribution could be, say, on the environment, which is such a big issue these days. Um, the basis of our whole legal system in enlightened times, shall we say, uh, uh, accepted by the UN and, and all the world organizations, m many governments, is the dignity of the human being. That's the basis of the system. You're trying to establish the dignity of the human being always in terms of what crimes are committed and, and offenses. But from a um, Hindu point of view, you would be talking about the dignity of every living being because all Atma, every everywhere there's life, there is a person and they're all given equal respect. So you would have to look at your legal theory from that perspective. But environmentally, that makes a huge difference because that means you couldn't offend animals without just cause. You couldn't offend them just because we're human, we're better, so they have to take a second place. That would be speciesism, according to Hindu thought. So it's it's an interesting, it's something interesting to bring to the public uh, space. And, and there are anyway, so many interesting discussions that could be had that are real intellectual challenges that because of these challenges, you can begin to talk about globalization. We're, we're currently not talking about globalization intellectually or spiritually. We're talking about it politically and economically. And even then, it's a pretty poor conversation, I would say, personally. It's just a personal thing. Um, but intellectually, we haven't started talking about it yet. You, how could you say that if there isn't a center for Hindu studies, uh, You know, if, if this is only such a recent thing? Who's been having the global conversation? We really are going to countries saying, here's how you have to think, because we've decided that this is how you have to think. You have to look at things from this perspective. This is These are the rules of the academy. So it's opening up that debate to be much wider, and it's challenging the 
academic norm and the social norm and the political norm and the legal norm as it should as good debate should we should look at things from not only an anglo-saxon perspective but also from an indian perspective and a chinese perspective and go into different um, indigenous cultures and see do they have a perspective what do they what can they offer our discourse mm -hmm so that we can actually talk about globalization. Because if the vast majority of people on the planet come from the Indian subcontinent and China, then why aren't there cultures as represented in global discourse as they should be? It seems like a, an imbalance. It doesn't seem like globalization. So that's that's a part of it. And um, yes. And then the other, another, um, so that's looking at it, the center, systematically and strategically looking at it as broadening discourse and then um building bridges in the center we've always known that once we start these conversations then there's a responsibility to help build, build bridges between communities um of discourse um uh so for instance so uh, build bridges among hindus that's one good place to fill a few bridges. There's so many type of Hindus. There's nationalist Hindus. There's uh, Shaivites and Vaishnavas and Shaktas. And there's theist Hindus and atheist Hindus. You just the whole thing. So building bridges among Hindus, building bridges among Hindus and people of other faith. And we've actually done some very positive work on that. There was a, a circumstance some years ago where there was a, hindu christian forum the anglican church in england was developing this as a national uh, place of discourse where these faiths could meet and talk to each other and help each other and, and work proactively for the good of society um but it wasn't working and uh we were asked to do a study to help it was a study called bridges and barriers and hindu christian dialogue and that became the basis of the discourse going forward mm -hmm. so there's so many ways if you go to a, an academic resource someone who is non-sectarian and non-political then when they do a report it it can help uh people think differently and and speak to each other differently but it also helps when the two traditions or three or four traditions speaking have parity of esteem where the people involved um really feel that they are on the same page that both of them are writing the rules of the dialogue and that's that's where the the barrier was in this case the hindus didn't feel like they were part of the dialogue they were just being talked to and that was just unfortunate it was well-meaning christians who were highly educated in their own tradition talking to well-meaning hindus who weren't educated at all in their own tradition who were business people and shopkeepers and uh, etc so so how how do you write the rules of dialogue the the hindus ended up always listening to the advice of the christians but it, but beginning to feel uncomfortable with it and we find this in so many uh, circumstances but it's also building bridges with um the corporate world we were asked by the dow jones to develop a dharma index um a way of investing money dharmically so that it would be according to Hindu principles. And we advised them not to do it according to Hindu principles, which is, doesn't sound like uh, the thing that the Hindu center should be doing. But we said, why not do it according to Dharmic would include Buddhism and Jainism and Sikhism as well, uh, and maybe a lot of yoga people. So they they um, that's, that's what we did. So So it was something that we never thought we would get involved in. But um, it just came up and we were able, able to, when um, 2008 happened with a big credit crunch, we were asked to give talks at every major finance institution in London um, to look at the credit crunch from a Hindu perspective. How, you know, who would have thought? Um, but we were able to do it um, effectively and in a way that we got asked to come back and give talks on leadership and various things. So again, you're you're building bridges between traditions communities traditions and thought traditions who do think about these things have something to say and how to translate that into a modern context and into a corporate context um and we did have to you know when you give a, a talk in oxford 
and you give a talk um, at KPMG or Deloitte or somewhere, it's a very different kind of a talk because these people are very passionate and everything has to be in little cliff notes, as they call them. And you have to you compress everything into three words and be able to put them on a screen. Um, but but it, it worked. It worked. They, they were uh, interested. Also, in terms of um, the yoga community that I mentioned, the yoga community is very interested in the antecedents of yoga. So after 30, 40 years of yoga, um, people are now very interested in, okay, well, this isn't just about exercise, is it? Uh, they're beginning to look at the text. The yoga people are, are starting to learn Sanskrit, starting to read the text themselves and study them. And that's very positive. So to uh, create courses and opportunities for these people um, is, again, very important socially because so many people are doing yoga. And it's kind of important that they know what they're doing because um, yoga isn't really just about exercise. It's about so much more, uh, primarily control of the mind. Um, but it's good to be able to talk about it. And in terms of uh, spiritual care, there are Hindus, as I say, in diaspora in practically every country now. And there are chaplains and spiritual carers in hospitals, in prisons, in schools, in colleges, um, in the uh, military forces and the police to take care of the spiritual needs of all the people, all their employees and all their people. And they're beginning to see that they have a lot of Indians, a lot of Hindus, a lot of Jains. How do they take care of their spiritual needs? So who trains the chaplains? Who trains the spiritual carers in a hospice? Uh, how do you, that's, you know, helping someone to die is, it's, it's, it's a big, it's a big deal. Uh, it's a big thing to do. And, and you do require some help, you know, some training, basically. And also, after you go through it, you also need some kind of help to deal with the fact that you've gone through that with, with someone. So how do you set up those systems? So we're involved in, in uh, helping develop um, that kind of thing. So, so this, these are things that are not just about the academy, but there are things that can be done because of the academy, because of the kind of research that's going on. This is the uh, trickle-down effect. And now I'm going to do something that everyone has to do in life, and that is plug in my computer before it dies. Excuse me. I should have done this before I went online, but... Voila. Okay. Um, and then uh, another thing to talk about is accessibility. Um, it, the center is about making the education as accessible as possible. Uh, and this came to us very early on as well when um, people would come to us and say, well, I can't come to Oxford. How can I have access to this? So we started to do um, courses in London and Birmingham and Leicester here in the UK. And then people started to come to us from America and Australia and India. And, you know, we couldn't travel all over the place. So we um, uh, just we, we started to do online education before it was popular, uh, before Zoom. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, I, I'm sure quite a number of you may have benefited from our online courses, which are developing and developing. Um, and, and that is just a, an effort. We we keep the prices very low so that it, they can be as accessible as possible. We also have a, a hope to develop cradle to pyre education, to do educational programs for young kids and teenagers. Um, at the moment, we're dealing with 18 up, but also to go back down. There are a lot of a lot of parents who would just like some programs that they can download, that they can audio or video, they can show their kids or uh, and uh, all kinds of uh, things like that. But they can all be done if we have the resources, but at least we have the plan. Um, and of course, accessibility is also about encouraging students to help them understand that this exists and this is something that they can get involved in. And then there are our desire to do summer schools. We have done summer schools before uh, and COVID obviously upset them a little bit. We want to get back into that. And also tour schools, which is something we've never done. Well, we have done. Actually, Tanya, who's here, 
is uh, just pulled off um, a brilliant summer school in Nepal, in Kathmandu. Um, and we had over 20 students come from all over the world. And it was a great program. And this is something we could do in all parts of India and go to a place and do a Hindu studies course focused on that area and what's going on in that area, the traditions of that area, the culture, the history, etc. So, um, yes, I think that's all the blather. I think you've had enough blah, blah, blah from me. Um, I'd like to open it up to uh, to all of you uh, uh, to question what I've said and uh, um, comment on it and start arguments and all all the rest. Do please feel free. Oh gosh, we have we have Bjarne and Rad Balkaran and all kinds of people here. <laughs> I just just looked at the second page and Pasha. Pasha, you're always good for a question. <laughs> Yeah, we have a question in mind, but we want to give others a chance to ask first. Um, okay. <laughs> well, is anyone going to take up Pasha's invitation to ask first? Please put your, you know, you'll have to put your little yellow hand up because otherwise no one can see you. No, Pasha, it's you. Yeah. Well, I was wondering if you could help elaborate what how being Hindu isn't academically any different from Hindu either studying it academically and think they, for lack of better words, they know it all. Yeah. For example, Oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> um that was, really came... nice, that was a really nice experimental sound. Experimental music. It it was, it was. Shostakovich would have been happy with that. Um but uh, Pasha, we didn't we didn't hear your question. We're going to have to come back to you. But we could um, you could write it in the chat. And it sound it sounded like it was going to be a very good question. And very unfortunately, you've frozen with one of the silly faces. But... Are you back again, Pasha? No, he's not back again. Uh, Raj, could you could you write to Pasha and? Sure, we'll do. Ask him, uh, also, ask him to write his question. Uh, yes, yeah. absolutely. Hello, Shalaka. Nice to see you. Um, maybe it was prophetic that he asked that someone else go first, and Vijay's hand uh, is up. So yes. there you yeah. are. We'll go to Vijay. Vijay. Hi, good evening, everyone. And um, lovely to um, hear you, Shanuka, explain about. Um, uh, uh, OCSH and uh, um, I I only by chance find, found out about you during COVID and I'm so glad and so blessed that I have because I've really thoroughly enjoyed the um, courses um, and I've done three so far uh, and I've really valued them and I just wanted to say that I haven't got any specific questions right now but um, I, I was really impressed and I wanted to find out whether it was uh, from the actual Oxford University or whether it was a separate uh, entity. But um, it seems to have evolved from the university itself, which is such a amazing, um, uh, amazing to know, really. And uh, the fact that it's become what it is um, and how it can um, help future generations uh, because um, it not only enhances um, the knowledge um, that perhaps is kind of lost, um, particularly over the um, generations, um, in a way that um, although we, um, 
access our culture um, by the traditions that we follow and um, worship uh, the uh, various gods and goddesses that we do. Um, this is a way forward, I, I think, and it, it's, it's brilliant that um, there's so much um, interest uh, and uh, what you plan ahead as well. And um, I've got a, um, I've got a passion and a, uh, an idea that perhaps because um, um, I I I, uh, I watched a, a video where you had invited uh, Amita Bachchan to um, um, uh, the college, and uh, uh, I, I avidly watch uh, his. Um, his show on the TV and he has a special um, day where he invites people who um, have done amazing um, works of um, charity of the charitable things um, which have benefited people and I think that this is a great opportunity whereby we can we can push this forward for for the benefit um, of uh, uh, our own, uh, sorry, uh, people in India as well as others to know more about what what the university does with this course and um, how it benefits everybody and can benefit everybody. Well, thank, uh, thank I just you. Wanted to that. say that. No, thank you. Very, very good suggestion. I just, I do, I would just mention that um, we're we're not part of Oxford University. We've uh, decided to remain independent, even though there was discussion about merging but um but our scholars are are members of the university so they're they're so they're supervising phds and teaching and and tutoring and doing and setting courses and everything so we're we're working very closely with oxford university and most of our students our students in oxford um are all oxford university students obviously so um so we work hand in glove but we're not we're not Oxford University. We made a decision to to keep separate. Uh, just just to clarify that, um, uh, T Patel. Um, yeah, want to ask uh, a question. Good evening. Uh, good so evening. I uh, I was interested uh, with your sort of uh, submission of uh, meeting you. With, uh, the, uh, so, so sorry, um, we we have so, difficulty hearing. Sorry, can you can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, keep yeah, it close. Okay. So uh, I was interested with your comment that uh, where the Hindus and the Christians, I think you said Christians, who, who met, and the Hindus felt that they were just being talked at uh, predominantly because uh, the, the academic aspect of Hinduism was missing. Then. So I've also had personal suspicions that uh, uh, after taking a course with Hindu, uh, uh, not Hindu, one of the courses, uh, and uh, I also felt that probably uh, the, the uh, um, Hindus are let down by the fact that uh, they are majority are not academically uh, learning uh, the faith, but that faith is actually tradition and culture passed down from generation to generation, and which obviously varies depending on which you know even to the next village uh, where you go down to uh, in. in uh, so, uh, I mean, do you have a uh, like any advice on uh, how this can be remedied? Um, obviously, not everybody is going to take a call, but at the same time, there's a lot of stuff in the cultural way uh, and uh, customs that uh, are carried out, which are probably not taught. Yes, no, it's it's a very good point, and um, it's not something that. I had a solution uh, to, um, but observationally, I have seen over the last 40 years how um, young people um, know less about their culture than they did when I, when I first met young people. Those young people are obviously 40 years older now, um, but I, I meet young people not only in the diaspora and in India, and I'll mention a story from the Mahabharat or the Ramayan, and they don't know what I'm talking about. That wouldn't have happened 40 years ago or even 30 years ago. 
um and and uh, not only the story but they don't even know the characters in many cases so they're so the the um traditional cultural transmission of knowledge that process is failing and part of the failure is that family traditions are changing the um nuclear family is becoming uh more common it's not absolutely common and it's not um uh, the extended families are still a big thing of course but um people are remaining separate they're traveling further away from family groups so so there are changes in culture that do affect the traditional processes of transmission of knowledge and uh, how do you supplement that um and that that's part of this educational program if if things are online then they're, they're they are actually very accessible and we we end up uh, we, with our continuing education department in classes in online uh, programs uh meeting people who really don't know anything about their tradition they say they're hindus but the reason why they're signing up is they want to know more and uh they haven't had any access to somewhere to get it apart from their grandmother or their aunties or their parents um but a lot of them are now very well educated and they're asking questions that their grandmother and parents can't answer so so it's it's not a question simply of of um uh using the traditional methods there's also a, a question of educational growth and a need to that needs to be addressed there that young people are more they critically analyze in a different way they ask different types of questions um they'll ask critical questions that your grandmother wouldn't expect to be asked she's not a theologian or a philosopher you know so so there are there are big issues in education that need to be addressed and and we we would like and we we hope that we are helping to address them but thanks that's a that was a good question um i'll go on to abhishek and then we'll go back to dr mitar because Mit, dr mitar wrote it and i'll have to read it but abhishek if you could go ahead first yeah uh hi my name is abhishek i just i'm just new to uh, uk but um i'm closely associated with the organization called chinma mission uh so the the thing which you are doing uh chinma mission is already doing it uh so they are more into studies more than the bhakti mark and uh, but uh, one thing is that uh when hinduism studies are not uh, most pe most people are not connecting it with to with the scientific angle if more intellectual people come in they can uh, because there are a lot of things like the bhagavad gita vedas upanishad hidden messages inside which uh, will uh, give which can be connected more to the scientific like the black hole and other things because in india uh, all hindu uh, preaching are like i go to different study classes they are more in the bhakti angle so we if we look it uh, at a different angle we can analyze many other things also so if we bring in more intellectual people so it will be more good for the coming yeah. generation no uh, thank you thank, thank you abhishek and i'm sure i i know the chinmaya mission very well i met yeah. swami chinmaya nanda um yeah. so and and you do very good work you you don't do work at the academic level so much um uh, one of your trustees here in the uk dr um ramesh patni got his doctorate mm -hmm. at, at the center here in oxford so we part of our work is to help traditions like the chinmaya mission swami narayan's iskon um the ramakrishna mission to send their people to oxford have them educated and go back into their traditions to do exactly this to build up the intellectual tradition and to make a distinction between knowledge and bhakti i think isn't fair i uh, the the bhakti traditions are studied at our center as long as there as well as every other uh, uh, tradition the bhakti traditions have a huge um, knowledge base they have more literature than sankaracharya produced for instance uh, of an intellectual nature so it's it's all worthy of study and it's important that we don't um simplistically think that some people are worthy of studying and some are not or we're hearing too much of this or that 
Um, our center is not sectarian, not political. We don't favor one over the other. We just look at what we find and we study it for what it is. And that's the only way you can approach things because otherwise you become exclusivist and then certain traditions will feel that they're excluded from the process because we're not taking them seriously. We have to take them all seriously because they are serious and they've all been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Then, of course, you have to take them seriously. I mean, how would they have survived otherwise? Um, so, so to do it with integrity, we have to um, study everyone's tradition. We can't look at it from, from one tradition's point of view and exclude others. But but your but thank you for your uh, contribution. Uh, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just go to the next one, yeah, uh, Abhishek. No problem. No. Um, yeah, Doctor Mitar says, I'm just reading from the chat. We do a program in India which is called the Value Education Olympiad for school students. Last year we had two lakh thirty thousand students who registered, and we reach out to fifteen countries. This program has concerns for environmental and ethical education. Is the center looking for collaborations for short term programs and with school students? Um, uh, the easy answer is yes. The uh, difficult answer is, uh, well, how do we keep, cope with all that? So it, it's just a matter of resourcing for us. We, we only have so much bandwidth. So if it, we're, we're very happy to talk about collaboration and then see what's really possible. We do collaborations with um, uh, institutions in different places and they send students to us, but we we have it well discussed and well organized beforehand. Um, and when you talk about school students, it would have to be the higher level of school students. You know, it, it's the young kids wouldn't wouldn't work for us at this stage. We don't we couldn't facilitate that at all, really. But anyone from 14, 15, 16 up with that could could be could be possible um if they're chaperoned and and all the usual stuff. But but that's it's worth looking into and thank you for bringing that up. Um right. Um there you go. Anyone else has a suggestion or a comment? Pasha, what happened? What happened to you? <laughs> Do you want to try it again? Testing. Could you hear me now? Yeah, it's still just a bit choppy, the... Pasha. Yeah, someone someone suggested that if you if you turn off your uh, video, it it's still fairly choppy. Perhaps you can type your question into chat and have it addressed. Oh, he's done that. He's done it. Wow, that was quick. <laughs> he had he it said, saved, but he was he was he was waiting in to see if the tech would work. So, okay. would you like your Raj on a card? Would you like to read it? Uh, no, uh, go ahead, read it, Raj. Thanks. I'll, I'll give you a hand here. Apologies, uh, I'm using Wi-Fi from a travel lodge in Norwich. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask if you could clarify what you mean by studying Hinduism academically, and how would the OCHS be different from more nationalist-oriented Hindu organizations that do set up their own Hindu universities and Hindu academic programs. Yeah. Um, uh, well, yeah, that's, that's very good. Uh, um, studying Hinduism academically, so to qualify that, it, it means studying it according to the, uh, the norms of, of scholarship as we understand them in Oxford. And, and Oxford has laid benchmarks I mean, people say that Harvard is the Oxford of America and such and such places, the Oxford of such and such. So thankfully, we're in the Oxford of Oxford. Um, but it, it means that we can study um, at the highest academic level, looking at things dispassionately. We stand back from it. We're not looking at it from any political bias, any religious bias. We're trying to investigate it from all angles of vision and then compare it to other things and share it with colleagues and have it peer reviewed. So going through all that process, that's what we mean by academically. Um, and when you talk about um, Hindu nationalist uh, organizations, well, because we're not political, we're not nationalists. So we're very interested in Hindu nationalism because we can study it and we can look at it and, and examine it and, and explore it. Um, it. I mean, Hindu nationalism is just an interesting idea. Uh, because it's so 
so Hindu nationalism, nationalism being a concept developed in in the 1800s in Europe, particularly in Germany, and now it's in India. So it's not an Indian idea. Uh, so that's so it's an interesting mi mishmash. Who's discussing that? That would be interesting to discuss in itself. And how did it develop? And it developed as a political idea, not as a religious idea. In actual fact, the developers of it were quite non-religious. Um, but it has now religious overtones. It's developed into something uh, uh, different uh, that's kind of awkward in, in, in many cases. And yes, they are setting up um, Hindu educational things. This is a very recent development, and we're interested in them to study them. Um, uh, I did get a, um, a document from one of those institutions, and it it was uh, I'd, I'd asked them for a briefing document. They wanted to have a conversation about their program, and it said um, every time it said Hindu, it did stroke Hindutva, and they're equating the two things, and that's just very that's just very difficult. <laughs> the, so so how is that an academic program? I, I I can't see it as an academic program because it's then it's very politically oriented. So so it's 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 interesting to see what they're doing. It's interesting to see how they'll do it, how they'll um, uh, approach issues of history, issues of culture, issues of of uh, society, uh, and political theory and, and the like. Um, but our interest in them is that we would like to study them from a dispassionate perspective. Um, uh, Oliver says, Oliver, are you there to ask your question? Yes, uh, I want to, yes. Uh, I'm also interested in the recent change in Hinduism, uh, ph philosophy, religion, and society. Uh, do you treat also with it uh, in the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies? Uh, the the move of society, the the violence, the thematic of violence, etc. Yeah, it's not. Um, it's not. We don't have any lecturers or researchers in that field, but it's a it's an area we're very interested in. We're very interested in 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 developing into that field, um, and it's part of it. Links back to the last question. I see in your chat thing, you also mentioned uh, transformation of Hindu religion and yoga as well. Uh, yoga and also mindfulness, which is Buddhist and Hindu and Jain. So again, very India oriented. So how these these things are having an impact uh, more broadly um, and how Hindu nationalism has an impact on geopolitics, yes. um, for instance. So th these are things we're very interested in and in area of areas we would like to get involved with. There's a lot going on in these areas in many universities in the world now. Um, a lot of people are picking up on this, but it's, an, it, it's a very interesting area. I suppose the most interesting area for us would be how any of it is connected with Hinduism. Um, Hindu nationalism has manifest as a new form of Hinduism. So I can't call it not Hinduism because people claim it to be Hinduism so fair enough um so but how how does it where does it connect to uh Hindu scripture and Hindu tradition and Hindu practices and how has it developed the way it has because claims are made that it is traditional Hinduism when it's difficult to find the thread uh sometimes so I'm very interested to to um look at things from that point of view Okay, thank um, you very much for this point, yes. Yeah, thank you, Oliver. Um, Raj, is that a question I see from you in the chat? You're you're very good at chatting, so you could actually say it. Sorry, there's a... No, that's not that's not this, Raj. That's another one. Would you like me to read it out loud, regardless? Oh, it's, it's a, yeah, un, unless Raj wants to say it himself. I don't know which Raj this is. Raj, you wrote, you wrote a question. A danger of studying Hindu academically can distort and twist Hinduism. 
No, Raj, you can, uh, Raj Balkran, you can, you can read it out, Raj. Uh, I'll, you know what, I'll help you, jean I'll read the uh, questions in chat, sure. Uh, yeah, is there a danger you. that studying Hinduism academically can distort and twist Hinduism? Given the perverse incentives in UK academia, um, uh, sorry, someone else just typed, so it just moved up a bit. Given, given the perverse incentives in UK academia, is it it is in the money and academic status interests of an academic to develop position in a debate rather than truth in itself. It is in the publishing interest of academics to cling to a position rather than pursue truth. Well, there's, there's no loadedness in that question. <laughs> that's straightforward. Um, that's, that's pretty straightforward. Um, is there a danger studying academic and distort and twist Hinduism? Of course, there's always a danger. There's a danger in in everything um, uh, like this. But but as I said, the the center and any any reputable academic institution, uh, their whole point is to avoid such um, uh, kind of a, a such prejudice. And and prejudice essentially derives from ignorance. Uh, and the idea of, of studying is to dispel ignorance. So you're you're trying to find uh, truth, maybe not with a capital T, but at least as, as uh, interesting as it can get. And the idea of, um, oops, gosh, they're coming thick and fast. The oh, idea I'll, is, I'll manage them for you. Yeah, okay. Uh, the money and the academic interests of an academic to develop a position and debate rather than truth itself. That's just very individual and very personal. And I would say that happens in any endeavor. There's always someone who is just more focused on themselves than anything else. There's always someone who's greedy. There's always someone who's angry. There's always someone who's power hungry. I think that's just life. We we bump into them everywhere. Um, are they in the academy? God, yeah, they're everywhere. Uh, so, so what do you do? Well, you don't employ them. <laughs> Uh, and you know you, you let them to some other institution or some other person or let them become uh, independent researchers and academics as a lot of them call themselves and that's absolutely fine but but the center we're not interested in that and we're not interested in that kind of prejudice that the whole point is that by establishing a benchmark in hindu studies that we establish it with real integrity that there's a, a sympathy for the tradition you're studying you know, it's and and that's not a prejudice. That's just empathy. That's just the milk of human kindness. So you look at a tradition, and you're sympathetic towards it. You're you're not antagonistic. You're not trying to disprove the tradition. You're not coming at it from that perspective. No, you want to open up the tradition. You want to understand it. You want to share it with others and say, look, I've looked into this tradition. Here's what I find, and then just lay it out and and let people decide for themselves. So you're not trying to load it. That that's where the center is coming from. Um, do you I will, I'll just very, very, very briefly share that um, I'm also a scholar of Indian tradition, seeking the truth without you know a monetary or political agenda. And I've decided to promote the OCHS wherever I can, you know, pro bono, because it's clear to me that the center operates from an ethos of respecting Indian religious traditions. And I think that's crucial. It's, it's, it's an important question you ask, um, but perhaps it's geared towards uh, folks of other bents uh, elsewhere. Uh, there was a comment earlier, greetings from Scotland. I have taken two courses and it was an awesome journey, a true path from darkness to light, a tamasoma jyotir gamaya, very informative and enlightening. Thanks for all of your hard work. Well, you're very welcome. Um, Good evening, all. I have a question. So which is the correct term? Hinduism, which is actually not a religion like Abrahamic religions or Sanatana, or Sanatana Dharma, which is used widely referred to nowadays. I'm in conversation with many young persons on a daily basis. I need some clarification on this so I don't confuse them. Yeah, that, that's that's a very good question. And that's really up to the individual. It's also it's also a bit circumstantial. So uh, so I, I myself am a practicing Hindu. But I, I wear the term lightly because it's ill-defined. So I, I like the term Sanatan Dharma. Some people use the term Vaidika Dharma, which means the Dharma of the Vedas. Um, some people call themselves um, a Bhakta, which means the servant of God, which is looking at it differently again. Um, but it's, it all comes back to the same thing. My wife and I, when we got the census, um, 
I used to put down Hindu and she put down Vaishnav. So then the next year I put down Vaishnav and she put down Hare Krishna. <laughs> so there's just so many identities you can trot out. Fair enough, you know. So so Hinduism is is very pluralist in that sense, and all the identities kind of refer to the same people. So it's it's not a question of either or or this is the right one. Um, this is this is the one that we'll do for now. I mean, if someone comes and asks me my religion, just some basic person comes up and says, and what religion are you? I'll just say Hindu, because they're not really wanting, they don't really want to engage with it. They're just asking me a simple question and they want a very simple answer. And if they want, oh, what kind of Hindu? Oh, okay, so they know something more. So I'll say, I'm, I'm a Vaishnava. Oh, what kind of Vaishnava? Oh, I'm a Gaudiya Vaishnava. And then it starts to get, <laughs> it starts to get more complicated. But uh, I wouldn't start with saying I'm a Gaudiya Vaishnava because he just blew them out of the water. No reference point there whatsoever for the vast majority of people. So I, I, I'm I happy to use the term Hindu. I've been called worse. Uh, that, that'll do. Um, but but yes, we can say Sanatan Dharma um, when, when we're talking to young Hindus. That would be a that would be a good one to use. But interestingly, I've heard so many definitions of Sanatan Dharma. And some of them quite contrary. So, so again, that's a whole class in itself. What is the Natan Dharma? I don't think it's uh, it's it's never it's never simple in Hinduism. And and uh, thank you, Raj, for your your testimony earlier on. It was very kind. You're welcome. I mean, I I really and truly feel called to support the center for nothing more than I, I believe in what's being done there. Um, uh, yeah, Alok Sharma says, uh, good evening, Shanaka Ji. Good to hear you. My question is, how do you or the center look at Sikhism or Jainism as a sect of, of, of Hinduism or Sanatana Dharma or as a standalone religions, considering that they, they originated from Sanatana Dharma? Um, hello, Ashok. Good, good to hear you. Ashok is a, a local here in Oxford. Um, well, uh, it's from a personal point of view, um, if people call themselves Jains and Sikhs and that's their identity, then that's what I'm going to call them. And I'm not going to say that they're Hindu, even though they may share a lot of Hinduism uh, in their uh, cultural practices, their wedding processes, their death rites and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, you know, however people present themselves, that's how they want to be identified and that's how they need to be identified. So I think just to label everyone Hindu uh, you, we can get into a lot of trouble. Uh, and uh, some some Sikhs and some Jains and some Buddhists even don't mind that one way or the other. They just think differently about these identities. But um, the vast majority of them are actually, you know, I'm, I'm a Hindu, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Jain, I'm a Sikh. So if, for instance, you go to Nepal and there are Buddhists and Hindus and they're, they, you know, mesh very easily but you don't marry into a Buddhist family or a Hindu family from one of the other cultures very easily. So there, there are all kinds of issues that you have to take seriously. Uh, that if these people, and you always find a, a, about, a lot about people in India if you approach them and say, can I marry your daughter? And then you'll find out what the issues of casteism and religion and culture really are. Um, so, so no, I, I wouldn't... Um, I wouldn't just band all these things together. I don't think that's appropriate. I don't think it's ever been appropriate in Hinduism either. Uh, I don't think I don't think Hindus. Uh, I don't think people in India, even as I say, the term Hindu, being used as we use it is very recent. It's really in the last eighty years that it's become such a common term um, among Indians themselves. So um, it, it's not the self-identifier. Going back to the last question. Shanika, do we have a hard stop at the top of the hour, or shall I read another question or two? Well, yeah, read another question, and then we'll stop, if that's okay. Uh, with the last one, just by the order that they came in, uh, is how does one become a researcher of the OCHS? Um, a researcher of the OCHS? Or uh, at, uh, <laughs> at, <laughs> at, but I don't want to editorialize the, the questions too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, knew, I knew what he meant. I was just winding you up. Um, well, to become a researcher, you really have to have a, a, an academic degree in the field that you want to research. So that's that's this that's the start. And then you make a proposal to the center, to our academic planning committee, and they review that proposal and 
there's a back and forth, and then we'll see what happens from there. We have about 17 research fellows associated with the center engaged in various projects. So it is something that ha that happens, but that's how. But we can we can do one more question, I think, Raj. Um, because that sure, was a, sure thing. Uh, there was a there's a comment, and then the next question is: To what extent does the center prioritize the exploration of non-Indian Hindu cultures and schools of thought, such as the one in Nepal? Non-Indian oh, Hindu, Hindu cultures. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, uh, being non-sectarian, non-political, then uh, the fact. The idea that Hindu culture is Indian would be a bit strange from a Hindu point of view. Um, so, so non-Indian is not an issue. Uh, I, it, it wouldn't be an issue. We're very interested to look at Hinduism in in Bali and Fiji and you know wh wherever it manifests and wherever Hindu theologians and philosophers and musicians and yoga practitioners and and the like, and how how yoga has developed, and how yoga developing in the West is influencing how it's practiced in India. So you know, if you don't study it, then you don't under, you even understand what's happening in India. So um, so I I think these uh, developments and transitions they they typify Hinduism. Hinduism is the oldest religious cultural thought tradition in the world. And one of the reasons is because it's just been so adaptable. It it bumps into another tradition or another thought process, another philosophy, and it goes, oh, very interesting. And then it just assumes it, you know, and it, it doesn't it doesn't assume it totally. It leaves it, but it just takes it, just plagiarizes everything that they do <laughs> and uh, and makes it part of their own. So that. That process uh, has become global, and I'm very interested to see how that develops. So it's something that we're very interested in, uh, non-Indian forms. And I think, I think that's it, chaps, isn't it? Yeah, is that that's a that's a wrap, as they say in films. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I think that's that, that's that we should end there, shouldn't we? Yes. Why not? That's as good a place as any. Thank you very much for that. And, and thank you all very much for engaging with the Centre, for doing courses, uh, and for coming, of course, to this session. I hope, I hope you come and can gain benefit from, from many others. Thank you very much.